Well, good morning. Today I want to talk about even if. And, and the main point I want you to get from this is even if you do everything right, bad things are still going to happen. Um, when, I remember when I was a kid, I had this idea that, you know, hey, if you do what's right, things are just going to work out. Everything's going to be fine. Bad things happen to bad people, and they pretty much don't happen to good people. Um, and I grew up a uh, pastor's kid. My dad pastored this church in, in California where um, every, it just didn't go well. Um, people didn't really seem to like each other. <laughs> there was a lot of infighting and there were power struggles and it, it just seemed like everybody was miserable. Like everybody wanted it to stop, but <laughs> nobody was uh, had any ideas or would put forth any effort maybe to stop. I don't really know exactly why I was a kid, but I know that... Uh, I know that you know there's just a lot of com conflict, a lot of fights, um, and people just really seem to hate each other. <laughs> uh, and then we moved to New Mexico when I started going to the church, and I really poured my heart and soul into that church. Um, but I remember that uh, uh, you know that it seemed like nothing was going to change, nothing was going to get better. So I just kept redoubling my efforts because I still I still believe somewhere inside that you know hey if I just keep doing the right thing it's just all going to work out. Well, I started having real bad depression and anxiety. Now, I've, I've had I've had depression and anxiety since I was a kid, but I started having just this real bad, real bad uh, depression and anxiety where it was even messing up, like um, when I would uh, go to go to Albuquerque for um, college and stuff, and it made it where I really had a hard time getting out, and I was kind of getting a little bit um, isolated and maybe um, agoraphobic where I was kind of trying to stay inside of my house I didn't really want to go to work and everything. Was just everything was giving me such anxiety, and I remember that when I was going through this, I started missing a couple services. And um, the church that I had poured my heart and soul into, they 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 didn't they weren't there for me. They didn't encourage me. They didn't anything. Instead, they reprimanded me and took away my ministries and made it where it was a thing. Now I understand, you know, being a pastor now, I understand, you know, that you need people who are faithful. I get that. But sometimes it's not really an issue of being unfaithful. It's an issue of going through a struggle where you need somebody's help and uh, I there just wasn't that there it was very much legalistic it was very much rules and and um, really you only have value so much as you contributed something so I uh, ended up going to college um, in in Dallas Dallas Texas and uh, I remember when I got there I just thought man I really belong this this is it I've arrived uh, I'll never leave this place so long as I live. I just love it. I love the weather. I love the place. I love the school. I love everything. I'm just going to graduate and instantly go back and just start teaching at this school <laughs> like they were going to hire me or something, right? And uh, so so I, 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 have, I know exactly what I'm going to do today and the next day and the day after that. And I'm just so happy. And then it happened. They're like, okay, well, you don't have enough funds to cover this, so you're going to have to move off campus. And so I had to end up dropping out of college. I was able to to continue in the next couple of years to do uh, distance education where I uh, learned on my computer instead of being on campus, but it wasn't quite the same because I left I left school and I moved back in with my mom and my, with my mom and my dad and I just really had no direction. I had no I had no idea what I was going to do. And uh, so me and my wife, we moved or it was at that time she was my uh, fiance, we moved in with my parents. She moved into my sister's bedroom and I lived, moved into my old bedroom and I just had no real idea of what I was going to do. I went from knowing what I was going to do and feeling like I absolutely belonged to going back into a place of complete, uh, I had no idea. <laughs> so then uh, I, there was a church open in uh, down south from where I lived and uh, they needed a pastor so I, I, uh, I put in for it. And they said that they didn't feel comfortable hiring me because I wasn't uh, licensed um, as a pastor, and that, that's a good a good reason to not hire someone. By the way, I'm not like bitter. That I think that's a great idea. Um, and uh, so I, I moved down uh, to that town that where I was at and um, started doing with the worship. But I, I really had no idea, you know, what my what my where I was going. You know, <laughs> I, I really had no idea. So uh, as I as I went there and as I contributed my ministry and I was really trying to push forward and really trying to do something, I still was young and thought that I could change the whole world by myself. And um, 
Well, I faced betrayal and the death of my son, and I got diagnosed with colitis and asthma, and, and all these things seemed to happen, and I just I just came to the conclusion I'm done. And this is the end of the line. I, I have I have nothing else to offer. Um, I you know I everything that I could have given I I did, and I've done nothing wrong, and yet everything goes keeps going wrong. And in that kind of a situation, it's very easy to get bitter. I don't deserve this. Why, why is it happening? And uh, we get to we get to the place where, where we just keep asking the, God the why questions. Why is it happening? Why didn't this happen? Why why is this person treating me like this? Why are these bad things happening? Why am I getting sick? What did I do wrong? And, uh, you know, we have this idea, I did everything right. Surely that means that everything has to go right. I mean, surely you felt like this too. And if we look in John chapter 9, we see something very similar. Jesus is walking with his disciples. <clears throat> and uh, they say this to him. They say, his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So they're walking, Jesus with his disciples, and, and they see this, this guy that's blind. And so they're, they're thinking, well, somebody sinned, which is why we're in this mess. Somebody messed up somewhere. So who was it? Was it him? Was it his parents? Maybe like before he was born, he did something in the womb or I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's because of what he was going to do in, in, with his life. I, I don't know. Somebody messed up somewhere, and that's the only logical explanation for why this man is born blind. And uh, we, do, we do something very similar in, in all of our life struggles. You know, we get sick. Why? Why, am I, why did I get sick? Why did this happen to me? Um, we have the death of, of a loved one. Oh, God, why would you do this? Why would you take them? There's other people who deserve to die. Uh, why, why would you do this? Why would you save them? Um, with our general life suffering, with problems that come up, with 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 when when a much loved um, person, like such as a pastor or or a parent or something, you have a tragic and sudden loss, and, and you're just like, what? Well, where do we go from here? How can we possibly make it forward from here? This is a place of no hope, and I, I just I just don't get it. So who messed up? Who messed up? And, and what did they do? That, that this is happening. Because surely, if I did everything right, this wouldn't have happened. And we get to that place, and we just run out of gas. We get worn out, we're spent, we're exhausted. We're burnt out, we just, we're over it. And St. Corinthians chapter 1 pretty much talks exactly about this. The, it was written by the Apostle Paul. And he's going through something very similar. He says, We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. So we despaired of life itself. You know, you hear people say, God will never give you more than you can handle. That's totally not true. He goes on to say, Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. There's a book I read. It's a fantasy story by a, a guy named Brandon, Brandon Sanderson. And it's called The Stormlight Archive. And one of the things that one of the characters says is most, the most important step that you take is the next one. And for us as Christians, the next step is the same as the last one. It's God. Where do we go when we don't know where to go, when we're out of gas, when bad things are happening, even though we did nothing wrong, when, you know, we're, when we're asking the why questions of why is this happening, God? Um, we're in that place of, of, of loss or struggle or death or suffering or whatever. W where's the next step? It's... It's the same as the last one, God. You keep seeking after God. You, you keep taking steps towards God. And God uses good and bad things to teach us, well, a lot of things, but three of the things that he teaches us is dependence. This is where we trust more on him and less on ourselves. We always think that we're supposed to be independent, that, oh, man, if I'm a mature Christian, I won't have to go to church, or I won't have to read my Bible every day, or I won't have to do this or that. No. Um, God wants us to learn dependence, and bad things happen, and they teach us to depend on God because we don't have the strength in and of ourselves. So another thing that um, that God uses good and bad things to teach us is true hope. See, before I got sick, my hope was in living a long, healthy life. Now I understand that my hope is in heaven. My hope is in the coming glory. I know that my hope isn't that I'm going to get better, that I'm going to have, you know, the funds to, to live my life in a level of comfort or, you know, that I don't miss out or whatever. My hope is that when I get to heaven, I'm never going to have to 
walk in this pain anymore. And another thing that God, God uses the good and the bad and just things in life uh, to teach us is wisdom. You can only really learn something a lot of times by doing it. <laughs> so you co-sign for a loan and you, you realize it was a terrible idea. And so that terrible thing that happened, it taught you wisdom. This is a good thing. And so that takes us to the to the verse, there are two verses um, that I want to look at today. And it says this in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 through 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, and do not, do not resent his re rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. As a father, the son he delights in. So when we look at this, there's two specific things that I want to point out. First is we need to clarify what is discipline. Because we're talking about God's discipline. So what is discipline? Well, somewhere in our heads, we see discipline as punishments, like spankings. You know, I did, I did bad, so I get punished. So God's basically giving me a divine spanking. But discipline is actually everything, everything, good and bad, in your life that God is using. And sometimes it's not even good or bad. Sometimes it just is. Just something happening in your life. So some things we, we think that they're good or bad, but they're just neutral. You know, it's more an issue of what do we do with it that makes it, that makes it bad. Um, like, for instance, anger. Sometimes we get angry, but it's not necessarily that angry, anger is bad. It's what are we doing with that anger? Is that an excuse to do something, well, something not good? And then the second thing that I think that this Proverbs points out that I want to kind of highlight is even if you did everything right, God... God still disciplines. And the reason for that is because God is concerned about your character, not your perfection. God is concerned about your character, not your perfection. If God was only concerned about you being perfect, let me go back here. If God was only concerned about you being perfect, then every time that you messed up, it would be the end of the world. But See, God already knows that you're not perfect, and that's the whole idea of Jesus. He is perfect, we are not. But rather, God wants us to grow from these things, to seek him more, to become more dependent on him, to understand him more, to, to see who he is more, and come to that place of learning his character and also allowing our character to be changed. It's not about doing all the right things. It's about being in a humble place where God can use you. So God's discipline when it's working and is, is very beneficial, it grows our faith. It moves us from an area to another area. And the area that it moves us from is believing in God. And it moves us to believing God. See, there's a big difference. There's a big difference. And God's discipline separates believing in God from believing God. Believing in God is more general. Okay, I believe God exists out there somewhere. I mean, I, I know that the Bible says that he cares for me or whatever, and I guess I believe those things. But when you believe God, it changes things, and you kind of turn the corner, and you start experiencing him for yourself. You start knowing him for yourself. You, you don't just believe that God is out there somewhere. You know that the things that he said are true, and you're going to stand on them. And even if it doesn't make sense, you know, it feels like God hates me. It feels like, a, like God doesn't care. But I'm choosing to stand on that faith. I'm believing God. I'm not believing in God anymore. I'm, I'm making that next step to believe God. He said that he's always with me. He said that he loves me. He says that these things. I'm going to believe those things. God doesn't hate you. He loves you. He has greater purposes. And because of that, he disciplines. The reason why he disciplines is because he has greater purposes. Now, you might hear a lot of televangelists talk about the way that God has great things for you, and so he, nothing bad is going to happen. And if it's something that is unpleasant or whatever, it can't be possibly from God. But that's not really true at all. Um, sometimes God can bring sicknesses by and things and allow the enemy to do it sometimes. And uh, there's never a moment when, when life has, has escaped his grasp. He is always in control. And so because he's always in control, he allows things and causes things and he disciplines us through the process. And the reason is because he has greater purposes. So he isn't done with your church. He's not done with your city. He's not done with you individually. And the fact that you suffer proves that God is not done with you. So you might be asking, well, 
how does this have anything to do with me? We're talking about, you know, trusting God and all these different things and, and how God disciplines. and How does that have anything to do with me? Well, see, we, we want suffering to end, but God wants us to grow, even if we don't, quote-unquote, deserve it. Does that kind of make sense? So we, we think, okay, I'm suffering. I want it to end, so I'm going to pray like this. God, make this situation go away. But God, instead, he wants us to grow. See what I mean? It's not about, well, do, do I deserve this bad thing happening to me? It really is irrelevant. When you're talking about God, it really is ir irrelevant if you deserve the bad thing happening. God doesn't give us what we deserve the grand majority of times. Even when he brings punishment, he doesn't really bring the punishment that we deserve. There's a song by Matt Redman, and it says, Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, Never once have we ever walked alone. So I would challenge you in two things of how this proverb, or yeah, how these proverbs, I guess I should say, uh, apply to you. The first that I want to mention is stop asking the why questions. Why is this happening? And start instead asking, God, what can I learn from this? Show me. Open my eyes. Let me see. Move from what to why. Why is this happening? No, no, no. What are you trying to do in my heart? What do you want me to see? What do you want me to learn? What in me needs to change? And then the second thing that I want to point out here, your suffering is the way that God leads you to greater faith. I'll say that again in case you missed it. Your suffering is the way that God leads you to greater faith. You want to learn, you want, you want to grow, you want to be a stronger Christian, you want to be a more mature Christian, embrace the messiness, embrace the, the, the chaos, embrace the suffering, and see it as the opportunity to grow. And that is really, um, I think, one of, the, one of the foundational things I had to learn growing up is even if you do everything right, <laughs> bad things are still going to happen. And that's okay because God is disciplining you. He's growing your character. He's, he's, he's fulfilling those, those prayers that you ask where, God, please help me to be a stronger Christian. Help, please help me to learn and grow. He's doing that. He's doing that. And you have to, um, you have to get on board with what he's doing um, and, and, and realize that he's got it. It's going to be okay. Even if it's scary, even if it's painful, even if ultimately it leads to your death, you know that it's okay because he's in control. He'll be with you through the whole process, and he'll never once abandon you, forsake you.